Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see everyone here. I'm Jack Knott. I'm the dean of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy, and it's uh, my real pleasure to welcome you here to the kickoff of the Neighborhood Data for Social Change Criminal Justice Data Initiative. Uh, for those of you who don't know that much about the Price School, we're a school that was founded about 90 years ago uh, in 1929, and we have very deep roots in the LA community. Uh, we've also worked over much of that time also with law enforcement. The original name of this school was the School of Citizenship and Public Administration, reflecting the fact that the founders really cared about civic engagement and the role of citizens in the policymaking process. So it's really great to see all of you here uh, representing law enforcement, nonprofits, private companies, uh, and uh, people out of the community, both individuals and groups. So that's exactly uh, how we got started as a school, and it's great to see all of you here uh, today as well. Uh, you know, since our uh, school got founded then, uh, we have had tremendous growth in the meantime, but we have continued to really honor our mandate uh, to bring rigorous fact-based research and expertise to bear on ethical and societal issues of our time, including especially right here in Los Angeles. And so this event is very special to the Price School uh, because it makes our research and, ex and expertise accessible uh, in the public square. Just as you did 90 years ago, we first taught our classes, not here at USC, but downtown in City Hall. Uh, and we rely on local community help as we uh, design our courses and teaching and think about how to do our research. And we strive then in turn to provide the community with relevant expertise, data, and policy and planning solutions. But it's a real uh, partnership. And in fact, uh, this forum highlights one of the Price School's great strengths, which is collaboration, both within USC and between USC and the community. It features two of our uh, research centers, the USC uh, Price, Saul Price Center for Social Innovation and the Safe Communities Institute. They are come together on this issue to improve the lives of people and families and communities here in Los Angeles and elsewhere. But we understand that in order to make positive change, we need to work together, we need to share expertise and data, and gain understanding and build trust. And that's what this is about. The Neighborhood Data for Social Chain Project really represents uh, the future of data collection uh, and community engagement. The platform helps civic actors better identify, understand, and address challenges we face in the local community. And as a course, this initiative comes at a very critical time. Uh, we are in a situation where we need to increase trust and integrity between law enforcement and citizens and the community. To do this, we need a better understanding of the particular issues and challenges our communities are facing. And we also need law enforcement to be embedded in and part of the community. The data are on their own are, however, not sufficient. Uh, the new criminal justice initiative also addresses the people element. Uh, we will host community trainings and convenings to bring together community representatives and leaders to better understand public safety and what it means for a brighter future for all of us. So I want to uh, thank all of you for your commitment to our communities and the families and individuals who work and live within them. And I'm so pleased again to see all of you here this early morning uh, to come together uh, to work uh, on this issue and uh, I really look forward to this important discussion. But before I turn the mic over, I'd like to say thank you to the team of the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy. 
for organizing the forum, especially Carolyn Bala, uh, the managing director, Megan Golding, the director of external relations, and Stacia Fiwax, our events quarter coordinator. Could we give them a round of applause for all the hard work that they've done? <clears throat> And of course, I'm very grateful uh, to Dr. Gary Painter uh, and uh, to Dr. Errol Southers, who are the directors and leaders of these uh, two institutes. I'm very proud of the leadership that they've shown, uh, both of the, in terms of the academic quality of these institutes, but especially in terms of making these institutes relevant and engaged uh, in our communities uh, through collaborative projects like this one. And I'm also see, pleased to see such a distinguished panel <coughs> is here also today. <coughs> and I'd like to thank uh, Vice President uh, of Civic Engagement at USC, Earl Pazinger, along with uh, Jumana uh, Silian Saba and Fernando Rijon for leading, uh, lending their expertise to this event. So thanks to all of you for being here as well. <coughs> so. With that, it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce Professor Gary Painter. Uh, he was the director of the Price Center. Gary's an expert uh, in the areas of social innovation, housing and urban economics, among other areas. He's also director of the center's uh, new uh, Price Center's Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Uh, you know, Gary's a really outstanding uh, teacher and scholar. But he's also uh, a very special person who is really deeply committed to using expertise and data in working with and in communities to help solve some of LA's key challenges. So uh, that includes homelessness and uh, local public safety and security. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gary Pinker. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me offer my own welcome to everyone that's here. We're excited to have a really full house, despite it being early. Uh, maybe that actually helped, who knows? But we're really excited to have you here as we begin our journey together. Um, as part of the, as, as Jack said, the NDSC, Neighborhood Data for Social Change, Criminal Justice Data Initiative. At the Price Center, our mission is to develop ideas and illuminate strategies to improve the quality of life for people who are living in low-income urban communities. And we do that through understanding and trying to activate social innovation processes. And at the beginning of some of those processes, I think all of us would agree, you have to have information and to understand whether you're actually improving, whether you're looking at small-scale pilots or moving up to kind of scaled interventions, you actually need to have data to make those assessments so that you can see if you're making progress in the direction you expected or if you actually need to change direction and go in a different way. And so in this particular area, and I'm happy to talk to others about some of the other areas that we're working on in the Price Center for Social Innovation, we recognize that perhaps, and I think I'm saying that a little bit facetiously, that relying on simply data like type one and type two crimes is not the way to understand how to improve public safety in our communities. And we have to go beyond that. And so that's what we're here today to, to talk about. What's great about this initiative is that it leverages the work that the Price Center and many community members who are here today, we have many members of our steering committee for Neighborhood Data for Social Change here today, or representatives of those organizations. And I wanna just thank you, if you could raise your hand if you're part of the steering committee or your organization is as well. Uh, so Phyllis, I guess I get to thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> I know there are others here, part of the Promise Zones, other, thing, uh, other organizations that have really helped us shape that initiative. And this, if you haven't, how many of you have been to the platform? I'll start with a question that gets more people involved, Neighborhood Data for Social Change. So we have about half the room. We thank you for being part of that. For those of you who aren't, um, I recommend that today you don't have your laptop out with you to go visit the platform. You might have your smartphone. Follow us on Twitter. That'll kind of help you find your way to the platform where we provide, you know, certainly on t Twitter and our newsletters, just kind of new data that came out. We just put up new data around se severe rent burden that families are facing. Um, and certainly we'll put out data that you'll be hearing about here today as well. It gives you the ability to kind of craft your own neighborhoods, to be able to kind of link how you conceive your community to a wide variety of data. And um, again, we continue to uh, provide trainings for those of you who are interested in using that. We do it both here at USC once a month, and we also go out to your communities. 
um, to see how we can help in those areas. We work with our partners in the city and in um, city of LA, small city, cities around the community, just any, anywhere in LA County, we're happy to help. So the way it works, and I think this is critical, and Jack alluded to it as well, is that we enter data not just through the, the lens of passive data that sits somewhere that has the ability to be mapped beautifully or charted wonderfully, and those things are all great, but really to do it through dynamic storytelling so that when people are accessing data, thinking about data in their own community, thinking about markers of change and so forth, that you actually have the opportunity to kind of think through what kinds of stories are told. And we have a partnership with KCET that helps us do that storytelling aspect. And we work with community partners who say, I want to help tell my story in my community. And these data are great, but they're not enough. And so what, what's great about those things is that we can put that texture to what can be, for some folks, data that you know are, are stale. They're just there. I don't know what to do with them. But, but understanding that the data captures something critical, but not everything. And so that's what NDSC is all about. And as I've noted, this is really what this initiative is all about. I wanted to give special thanks. We're very grateful to Microsoft. And Marissa from Microsoft is here today. So I want to thank you for helping us launch this journey. Um, this learned journey to really help bring new criminal justice data to the public in the region, so data that isn't currently available through open data portals, to work with partners in local law enforcement, as everyone probably knows who lived in LA County for a while, we have 88 different jurisdictions. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head, or, although my colleague Dr. Southers might know how many actual criminal justice or public safety agencies have such data. Um, so certainly some are covered by the sheriff. There's a lot of local cities here. Excited to see one, one such city from El Monte. Appreciate you coming today. From one of those bigger jurisdictions, but not on the scale as people think of LA, you know, city of LA or, or Long Beach. Um, in terms of the, the largest cities. Um, but we have to have that kind of partnership so that we can provide that fabric for, for the whole region. And so we're very grateful to have you participate in this journey today. I do encourage you to follow us on social media as we walk through this initiative. Also do it today. We have a hashtag, which is hashtag public safety data. If you're like me, you like to kind of, I take notes on Twitter through conferences. It's helpful for me to refer back to. Um, and it's also interesting to see what other people in the room are, are talking about, how you're understanding it. Um, I'm not necessarily good at it, um, but it, it, I, it, I do it so that I can enjoy and take notes. So you can tag us at, at uh, hashtag NDSC underscore LA and at the Price Center at USC Price CSI. So we'll begin today's event with a brief overview of the Neighborhood Data for Social Change platform. Um, and then I will have the opportunity to in, uh, introduce Dr. Errol Southers, the director of the Safe Community Initiatives, who will then facilitate a panel of experts who help us understand, define, and measure public safety in our local communities. The morning will end with facilitated table conversations to help us gather your information based on your insights, your work in the community about how you understand public safety and what kinds of data you feel like would be critical as you move forward in your communities to measure the kind of change that you're working so hard to um, engage in. So as I had mentioned, the Neighborhood Data for Social Change platform has these different critical elements. Uh, the interactive mapping, the ability to kind of aggregate your neighborhoods in ways that you can save for later so that you can follow that over time. A, a wonderful set of data stories and community trainings. Um, this particular initiative, as again I've hinted at, was recently launched um, and it's a one-year initiative which we hope will start a journey, not finish a journey, but enable us to begin to collect, aggregate, and disseminate neighborhood-level criminal justice data for select communities across Los Angeles County. We would love to have all communities, not just select communities, but we also understand that it will take time for people to be able to share together on these things. The goal, as noted there, is the reliable current neighborhood-level data that we can have community discussions and convenings and to inform what kind of data makes sense, but also to tell us how to tell the story around those data. And I think that's where you're going to see, I think, the most important work, especially here. And of course, they interact with each other, our ability to understand the data we have and actually be able to bring new data to the forefront. So just one example data 
set that is sometimes cited, but not as often. Again, the most commonly cited data come from those data that have to be reported to the Department of Justice, and those fit into type one, type two crimes, property crimes, violent crimes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here's a, a piece of data that it could be a, a uh, place for conversation. So citizens calls for service. We can look at the data, we can look at the data trend, and you can see that it's increased from around 778,000 in the county to closer to you know, 867,000. Probably can't see the small numbers, but that's uh, roughly where we're at. You can see that's been increasing. We might imagine that this is a, some of you in the room might be thinking, okay, well, this is a signal of something really good. Citizens feel like they can connect to their public safety officials and can actually report things that are happening in their community in a safe way. They don't feel like that, the, that they feel like they're going to get the good, good service. Others of you are sitting here in the room probably thinking, oh, this is a bad thing. That means there's more crime. There's more need to call public safety officials, right? And so here, this is an example where data is telling us something that's happening, but without understanding behind what's happening, we can't actually make sense of, of this kind of data. One of the things you can do to help make sense of the data is to, to map it. So this is just for the city of Los Angeles, and you can see uh, by mapping this, um, which is normalized by population, so it's calls for service by by population that you can see that in the darker colors there's more calls per thousand people and the lighter colors there's less and you might be surprised by looking at this that it's not necessarily where you might imagine calls for service emanating from some of the darkest regions are in the on the west side um, some of the you know kind of lighter regions per thousand actually are closer to downtown that might be a surprise so it again begs these questions of what are we capturing in calls for service per the thousand people, what does this mean for us? What should we do about it? And then of course, calls for service is too high level of, of, a, of a number because we actually wanna know what kinds of service calls do we have. So this is, you can start to decompose the data. Um, we're highlighting two categories here. The, the top line are people calling for things related to violence, harm to themselves or others around them. And uh, number two, it's, it's making uh, calls for service around public order disruption, like noise complaints, you know, reporting parties, or something else in the neighborhood that they, they feel like needs to be addressed by our public safety officials. As you can see in the graph, the uh, calls for service for uh, harm, violence, etc., have gone up more than the calls for service for public disorder. So one of the things that we're going to do with these type of data and, and with input from this event today and future convenings is to try to go deeper into a story around how we can understand these data, what does it mean for communities, and as I said, I, we invite your input as we go through that process um, moving forward. You know, there's a bunch of other possible data sets that even our initial convenings kind of behind the scenes have risen as possible pieces of data that we should actually bring publicly to the NDSC platform if we can get agreement from all public safety agencies, cities and county uh, sheriff, et cetera. And you can see there's a lot of possibilities around decomposing arrest rates, thinking about how these arrest rates vary by race and ethnicity, police stops, um, you know, what's happening as an outcome of those police stops, maybe bringing in school data related to um, public safety officials in our schools, LAUSD and beyond. So in our time today, we might, some of these might trigger things in your mind, but we really want to hear from you to think about what kind of data you think would be most important for the work that you do in your communities and to really try to capture this idea, this notion of public safety so that we can uh, more effectively describe what's happening in our community today. So with that, I have the distinct privilege to introduce my colleague, Dr. Errol Southers, to the podium. Um, and he will introduce a panel and moderate a panel to help us talk through and think through some of the issues that we have brought. By way of introduction, note that he is, uh, Dr. Southers is a former FBI special agent who has served in leadership positions in counterterrorism, public safety at every level of government, from police department all, all the way up. Um, his work spans many different fields, including counterterrorism, homegrown violent extremism, terrorist recruitments, radicalization, critical infrastructure protections, etc. Um, Dr. Southers has served in various roles here at USC, including the Associate Director of Research 
Transition and Associate Director of Special Projects at the Department of Homeland Security's National Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorist Events. He is also the co-founder of that institute's executive program in counterterrorism. And as you heard from our dean, he is currently the director of the Safe Communities Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Errol Southers. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, Dean, for being here. And as the dean mentioned previously, thank you all for getting up this early to be here for this important convening. And one of the things we're going to discuss <clears throat> with the panel is what is public safety? And public safety takes on a whole lot of different meanings to people. Criminal justice is taking on a different meaning to people these days as well. And so I have three very distinguished experts to join us today. Uh, the goal here is to talk about data, of course. And in the famous words of that data scientist, W. Edwards Deming, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So we make sure that data is something that we focus on. I'm, I'm going old school today because um, my, my dean has brought me into the 21st century, so I have an iPad, but I'm, I'm giving my disclaimer today. I had to go to my crutch, uh, to my paperwork here. So, but I think it's very important to really highlight the talent that we're going to have on this panel today. And I have the distinction of introducing panels regularly. And, and I do take the time because I think that these bodies of work that these individuals put together is worth noting and worth sharing with you. Earl Paysinger, in the interest of full disclosure, has been a friend for most of his 41 years at LAPD. We've known each other very well. He was appointed Vice President of Civic Engagement on July 1st of 2016, provides strategic leadership, development, and oversight for USC's community outreach programs. For four decades, he was at LAPD. He acquired a deep understanding of our city's neighborhoods. He built positive relationships with residents, advanced a variety of highly effective initiatives, and most importantly, he was there as the director of, I actually saw, I'm sorry, assistant chief of uh, operations. So that means he had all the cool units under his command. Um, prior to this, as I mentioned, he was in the Office of Operations. He was under Char Chief Charlie Beck and Chief Bill Bratton. In this position, he saw the LAPD attain unprecedented success in crime prevention and reduction while forging enduring partnership with communities through the greater Los Angeles region. One of the things that I think is really important about Earl's career is his looking toward the future as it relates to our young people. He re-engineered the LAPD cadet program, and that provides more than 8,000 young people with vital lessons in academic excellence, character, and judgment. What I really am impressed with what Earl has done there is that those participants in that signature program have a 91% graduation rate from high school, and many go on to elite universities and institutions. He has a bachelor's degree from Cal State University, Long Beach. He's also a graduate of the federal of the FBI's Command College and West Point Leadership. It took me a little longer to radicalize him because he used to be associated with another Pac-12 university, but I, well, I was successful. He also has a master's from USC. You know, some people come along slowly, but he's here now. He's part of the family. I have a distinction here. Our second panelist is another longtime friend and colleague. Jamana Silian Saba. Jamana is highly experienced in developing and cultivating strategic partnerships, policy development, community relations with over 13 years experience in working with diverse constituencies. We've worked very, very closely on homegrown violent extremism and a number of items and ish initiatives out of the Department of Homeland Security. In 2015, she was invited to the White House to provide a briefing to, on the LA County model of building resilience cultivating social inclusion, and addressing all forms of extremism. She currently serves at the City of Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment, where she manages the Commission on Community and Family Services and Community Action Board. She was in the mayor's office when we met. She led the strategic goals to build social cohesion, increase social protective factors to prevent all forms of hate, bias, and violence. She has her BS in criminal justice and law enforcement, uh, got her MA in Negotiation Conflict Management from Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, and she's also an adjunct professor and taught courses as, at their, that location as well. She's currently a non-resident fellow with the George Washington University Program on Extremism. And last but not least, Fernando Rion. Fernando is the Executive Director of the Urban Peace Institute, who we also work very, very closely with. He is the Executive Director after helping build the Urban Peace Agenda for more than a decade. 
He established the organization's Urban Peace Academy as a platform to certify gang intervention workers, train law enforcement on the role of gang intervention, and in implementing relationship-based policing approaches and engage public sector leaders on violence reduction strategies. He's had over 15 years of working with nonprofits and a lengthy background in community organizing and program development. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Communication Studies from the University of San Diego and a Master of Arts degree in Chicano Studies from California State University, Northridge. So having said that, would you please join me in giving a round of applause and welcome our panelists to the stage. So Earl, I am going to pick on you first. What's that? <laughs> and, and in the interest of full disclosure, there's nothing more intimidating than having someone who's been at LAPD for 41 years risen to the level of prominence that he had that organization and having him as a student last year. So, um, <laughs> but I will say, he, he was there, did all the work and did extremely well and I was glad to have you. I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanna ask you to describe the work you do in your position here at USC and most importantly in doing that work, um, how do you engage in the communities that you work with around this subject of public safety or policing? Um, you know, it's uh, both an interesting and a complex question. You know, first of all, I think it's, um, it's a representation of, of recognizing um, that not only here at USC, but public safety, we have both a moral and I believe a constitutional responsibility to outreach to the community. Um, you know, sometimes I think we're lost on the idea that we are, well, formerly we, are public servants, right? And part of our responsibility is to engage of the people and lift the veil and demystify the work that we do uh, in law enforcement and also here at USC. Um, we, <clears throat> and there's a variety of ways, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a variety of ways in which we uh, do that. Um, the understanding that law enforcement exists on a, on a wide continuum and a lot of times in law enforcement and, and in private industry, uh, but particularly in law enforcement, mm -hmm. we tend to focus on the um, quantitative elements of that continuum, arrest, prosecution, um, the, the penal aspects, and all of that in between, when in effect, I believe that there should be more emphasis placed on uh, prevention, intervention, education, um, but those elements of the criminal justice continuum take a long time to manifest themselves, mm -hmm. right? And we tend not to be patient. Right. Uh, we wanna see things that happen um, in, a, in, a, in a microsecond, and, and many of us in the audience, we have, we have children, right? And we spend a lifetime raising the children, and none of us are all shocked and shaken when they turn out to be very successful members of the community. And if we translate that in a way, in the work that we do in the community, um, whether it be here at USC in engaging the community or in law enforcement, you know, sometimes I, I think that there is, there's very little nexus in our understanding you know, why the other part takes so long. And I think part of it we have a responsibility to be uh, more patient. Um, and, and really understanding what the community wants from us because sometimes it has nothing to do with enforcement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it has everything to do with just listening and spending the time, the energy, the resources, perhaps not in gang enforcement, but in, com in community approbation, seeking their approval, seeking their uh, participation, partnership, and collaboration in everything that we do. And I think the outcome, if we commit to that long term, will be something that the community is, is, uh, is more benefited by. One of the things, obviously, that we're wrestling with in this initiative is trying to put metrics to success. And what does that really mean? And in law enforcement, success has always meant, unfortunately, measuring negatives. And we're trying to determine, can we measure positives, and what should those positives be? Jamana, you've had a variety of roles. You really had an interesting balancing act with regards to public safety and then extremism and trying to get the community on board as we were working in the past in some of those areas. Tell us about your current work that you're doing and how does that relate to public safety? How do you define it now? Is it a broader role than just public safety? Does it encompass other components of people's lives as you go out and try to enhance their day-to-day -day quality of life? Wonderful to be on this panel. Thank you so much, Earl. Um, I'll start by just sharing a little bit about the department itself and the functionality of the department, and then I'll touch a little bit on the elements related to public safety. Mm -hmm. um, as a department, the department's mission is to promote livable, prosperous communities through the development and preservation of decent, safe, 
and affordable housing, neighborhood investment, and social services. So there are a number <coughs> of bureaus and aspects to the functionality of the department. Obviously, um, housing uh, is a big aspect in housing development, but also in terms of working in low-income neighborhoods in the service delivery elements, which include oversight of our family source centers, and that's about 16 family source centers throughout the city. Uh, these centers um, have a budget of nearly $9 million, mm -hmm. and they specifically provide services to low-income neighborhoods, and those services include things like financial education. They include things like um, promoting access to education, promoting academic achievement, um, employment. These are the kinds of services provided there. But the department also have oversight over our domestic violence centers. There are 16 agencies um, with, um, I'm sorry, there are nine agencies with 15 domestic shelters that the department oversees, which is about $9 million uh, of budget there. In addition to that, the department also has the commissions uh, and community engagement arm. And in that commissions uh, bureau, we have the commission on uh, the status of women, Commission on the Human Relations Com uh, Commission, Affordable Housing, but we also have the Commission on um, uh, Families, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Commission on Communities and Family Services, I should know this one, and the Community Action Board. Those last two commissions um, are specifically looking at poverty and poverty prevention. Uh, they not only have oversight in terms of the services, but they also are a policy recommending body uh, to the department, to city council and the mayor's office in terms of how the city prevents poverty. And so that's sort of very quick and brief overview of the department and the functionality of the department. Now on the point of public safety, uh, the Commission on Human Relations in particular has done a lot of work around positive intergroup relations, social cohesion, but also has done tremendous amount of work around um, community police relations. Um, more recently, they've hosted a round of dialogues between police officers and communities. And so there is that aspect in which public safety is part of the work, although not in a direct way. While the work of the department um, and the social elements within the department aren't necessarily directly related to public safety, mm -hmm. but they're very much the underpinnings of what we're really talking about today. And I think to kind of build up on your idea of momentum, uh, of a continuum, um, in one of my recently published papers, I very much described the sort of idea of a continuum to expand our understanding of public safety beyond the space of law enforcement or beyond sort of our very narrow scope in terms of public safety in the traditional sense of interdiction. And if we're able to then expand into the social domain, we really have a much more palatable and strategic way to better understand public safety. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna leave it here uh, and then we'll continue to build on those notions as well. Fernanda, you've done tremendous work over a long time that I've, I've viewed from far and near, uh, particularly as it relates to gang intervention and, and those kinds of efforts. Tell us about the work that you're doing and how does that relate to bridging that gap between particularly um, gang members and, and that element and public safety and increasing trust and credibility? Sure, so um, thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so the Urban Peace Institute, we implement violence reduction strategies and smart justice solutions to transform the lives of individuals, communities, and systems so communities can thrive. So our lineage comes from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, then to the Advancement Project, and in 2015, after about 10 years of work as an urban peace program, we started the Urban Peace Institute. So about four years into the Urban Peace Institute as a standalone organization. But that allowed us to really focus and live more into our mission, uh, which is social justice and to transform systems in the lives of individuals most impacted by violence. So a lot of our work, I started by training gang intervention workers, former gang members to be peacemakers. Um, and that work to see that level of individual transformation and communities really taking responsibility for public safety has been key to create that space. Because many times when we look at the war on drugs and the war on gangs, it's a law enforcement issue. Law enforcement alone, it's their responsibility to address safety. However, when you have investment 
Um, in this case, through the, the Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction Youth Development for over 10 years, started at 24 million. Now it's about at 28 million. And if you add private money, it's about $32.5 million invested in the most impacted communities throughout the city of LA. That's significant. And that, that's what makes it transformative. We're not interested in transactional work. We're interested in transforming our relationships. So part of the, the work to define public safety, many times public safety is defined from a public sector perspective, right? People on the outside saying this is what safety should look like. What we're interested in is also defining what community safety is. So from the voices of residents is how do you find community of safety? And it's not only, it's not only all right, did you have a number of shootings? Did you get robbed or any violent offenses in this area? Or what the number is, it's really the people's perceptions of safety. That's right. And you have to get into the nuances of safety, right? And it's different, it might be different, right? It might be different in uh, Ramona Gardens versus Watts, right? You have to look at the cultural nuances. And sometimes people say, you obsess on the nuances. But of course you do, because if you want to really understand and be able to represent the voice of community residents at the table in these policy conversations, you have to understand those nuances. You have to take them into account because any solution that you have, you could put $50 million in a community, but if you put it in the wrong place or it's not culturally appropriate or respectful, you're gonna miss it. And if there's no community buy-in, it's not gonna be effective. And the only way to really transform these systems, you could have private dollars being pumped in, but it does not become transformational until it becomes a value of society and you have these large systems that say, hey, as a line item, we're going to pump $50 million into these communities. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes transformative. And that's how we use our community assessments, our community engagements, our trainings, and all the lessons that we've learned throughout the last over decade and translate that to help us shape policy in order to funnel the money back to the communities that are most impacted. So now I'm going to press a little bit here because we are obviously here to talk about data. And I want to know how you use data to inform in your respective organizations, your policy or decision-making process. So, you know, back to you, Earl, we're talking about an environment in our past where we measured everything, as you know. Uh, and unfortunately, we measured things as they were built on negatives quite often. Um, are there metrics that we're missing? And you might even want to reflect on CompStat because CompStat is something that LAPD used to drive decisions with regards to deployment and community safety. Tell me what data you think is really needed to use or should be used to drive those decisions. And are we missing something in the way that we're doing it now? Um, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I think we do. You know, first of all, I think it's important to, to understand um, how broad the issue of public safety is. Uh, City of Los Angeles last year, the last year we had that we have uh, full data, for, for which we have full data, there's approximately 4 million, 4.2, 4.3 million people in the city of Los Angeles. And last year, um, to, to Dr. Painter's point, um, there were approximately 1 million calls for service and another 750,000 stops. So essentially, this, the Los Angeles Police Department in the city of Los Angeles contacted over 40% of the population of the city of Los Angeles. And, and those contacts, in some way, great or small, influence um, the perception, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, the perception that people have of law enforcement. I, I, I won't ask how many of you have been stopped. Please don't, please don't raise your hands. <laughs> but that's the reality in our work. And, and, and the other fact is, is that um, about 20% of the part one crime, again, that Dr. Payton mentioned, violent crime, 80% of it is property crime. Property crime, somebody broke into your car, somebody stole your cell phone, um, somebody broke into your business. You know, things that happen to you as individuals where you are not harmed. To the question of whether or not we're missing something, my friend mentioned something uh, just a bit ago, and I think it's a really important point. And, and I'm, frankly, I don't know how you measure it, uh, Jack. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how you do that. <clears throat> but the voices of the people. Now, whether it be by a, a regular survey, um, whether it be around the table bringing people together, when, when we miss the dialogue, when we miss the narrative of having a conversation with the people and listening to them about what they care about, you know, particularly as it relates to crime. Because the reality is, is that how we define crime and how the UCR, the, the, the Uniform uh, Crime Index, mm -hmm. Reporting Index, uh, many of you may know that that crime index goes back to 1930. 
And it was codified by a bunch of people that came around the table that perhaps didn't look like many of you in this room, right? And then it translated over time, and it hasn't, it hasn't changed remarkably since then. We've added you know, a couple of crimes here and there, hate crimes, arson crimes, but for the most part, it really doesn't speak to how, how and what you see in your communities that you define as being safe. And we will not hear that, we will not understand that, we will not um, really act upon it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an authentic and a rational way unless we hear the voices of the people in rooms just like this. Um, as a matter of fact, at some point in time, Dr. Southers, what I'd like to see is having this conversation out there beyond the walls, mm -hmm. right? And, and when we do that and when we listen, I, I think then we'll have a better sense, a better appreciation of, of what public safety means. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Comstat. Comstat <clears throat> is short for computer statistics where the LAPD and some other law, some other law enforcement agencies, um, they gather um, terabytes of crime longitudinally that go back to the, to the 40s and 50s. And w we ask ourselves, what are the permutations? What are the spikes, trends, clusters of crime, and where do they occur? And many of the decisions that are made in law enforcement in terms of, of deployment are based upon the permutations um, of that data that, that, that we see and we understand. But I'm not sure that's the total answer. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of the picture, and it's something upon which many law enforcement uh, agencies base their budget. But it's not the total picture. Uh, to my friend's point, what's missing in those gaps? I think those are the things and the conversations that we have with the people, listening to them, and then acting upon them, making them actionable. I think that's the secret sauce in, in, in terms of being responsive to the people. OK. Jamana, how do you use data to inform your decision and policy-making process? There are actually a number of ways in which we use data. Uh, a couple of things to, to kind of bring context to this conversation um, is uh, the CDC uh, looks at a range of uh, risk factors related to violence and violence prevention, broadly speaking. And, and interestingly, some of these risk factors um, look at poverty, access to education, um, exclusion, uh, lack of equi equity, equitable access to resources, services. These were all listed as risk factors. And so if we are expanding our understanding of what is public safety, we also need to then redefine and reframe what that really means. Certainly what it means in terms of the individual and how they feel what public safety is, but also thinking of public safety in terms of peace building, social cohesion, uh, but also in terms of well-being of communities, building healthy communities, families, and individuals. And so to that to that extent, uh, when we start to look at and how are we addressing poverty, how are we building social cohesion, how are we creating access, inclusion, and equity, these are all measures and matrix that we could think around how that then contributes to increasing public safety and increasing um, uh, not just access and inclusion, but really the well-being of people. Um, and that's really what our work is all about. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the specifics of how those services are, are delivered and how we then measure, there are a number of things that we do. Um, community engagement is at every level of our department and almost every aspect of our department. We regularly um, uh, seek community input into how certain funds are administered, where are the gaps in neighborhoods, whether we're looking at projects related to neighborhood improvement, or whether we're looking at dollars and funds that are gonna go towards services. There is elements in which we directly engage input from communities. Uh, there are aspects where we have surveys, where we uh, input, take input uh, from communities, but we also look to our partners in the <coughs> academic world. We look to people like you in, in USC and, and how uh, you're looking at research and data, and then we also look at how those things are then interpreted through our work. So there are a number of ways in which we look at data to measure our work. Um, in addition, uh, we also measure the quality of services. 
um, are we achieving what we're intending to achieve in terms of elevating and lifting uh, communities and individuals and families. And so we regularly also evaluate and measure our services, both in terms of our family source services as well as domestic violence services. So there are all sorts of layers and levels in which data does inform our policy, but also the work that we do on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, it is about our neighborhoods, it's about our people, and how we serve our, our communities and our neighborhoods. And you're, you're both absolutely right. We do intend to take this beyond, obviously, the campus as we go forward with this project. You know, our school was named after Saul Price, and Saul Price reinvigorated the City Heights area of San Diego, and when they reached out to the community and talked about public safety, it wasn't so much the violence that was happening block to block, it was small things, or I should say, things that law enforcement didn't think about with regards to, they wanted crosswalks, and they wanted lights in the alleys. And when they did a survey, they found out, we, we're, we know about the gang violence, but we want to be able to walk out in the alley and put our trash out and see where we're going. And we want to be able to cross the street in safety. And those were things that the police department didn't necessarily prioritize as they were trying to address the other issues. So Fernando, I want to ask you, especially since you're in the prevention business, uh, although we all are, but more so you, are there metrics that we should be looking at and how does data inform your organization and your policies? Sure, I think uh, one of the, it, so uh, Patrick Sharkey's book, Uneasy Peace, if people have read that, he really looks at the kind of lowest rate of violence in the country, I think it was in 2014, saying why, he's asking why, and he's kind of interrogating that question. One of the things, one of the gaps that he identified was that there really hasn't been a kind of a systematic evaluation of, of, of a community agency in reducing, increasing public safety and reducing crime, right? And so <coughs> part of the things about evaluation, as people know, is that it's the indicators, like what do you track? What data do you collect? And I think we have to be, start being creative and start thinking through what data you can collect. That data is out there. There's plenty of data out there. But then the next question is access to the data. So for example, in Chicago, they had some very kind of high level evaluators from Yale and other places meeting with intervention workers and saying, or uh, street outreach workers and saying, hey, this is the data we want to collect. The first thing they said is, we don't trust you one bit. What are you going to do with this data? Are you going to you know, incriminate the people that we work with, et cetera? And there was a gap in understanding of why that data was important, right? LA has come a long way. I mean, that was back in like 2008, 2009 here in LA, but, and it, it's evolved. And, and, and especially interventions are starting to understand the importance of data, right? Because if, if it's not recorded, if it's not you know, on paper, then it didn't happen. And so how do you, you know, sustain money, sustain the level of funding um, you know, for over 10 years? So the level of, of trust and having access to that data, what you're gonna do with that data, is that data actually user friendly? Can the agencies that are actually providing the data, because a lot of times they don't have the research capacity or the data analysis capacity in order to utilize that data to leverage funding, right? So there has to be other resources that are given to community-based organizations, um, provided to people that are collecting the data in order to say, hey, we can actually now have access to this and actually utilize it to, one is to kind of uplift the, the larger strategy, but also, too, to uplift the individual community members as well as organizations that are serving the people most impacted. How we utilize data, I mean, we utilize it in different ways. And so a lot of, a lot of the work in the, in the gang world it's not written down, and, and for mm -hmm. good reason, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, get, you get a lot of stories that you collect, but then there's also quantitative data that you can start to pull, right? And so the easiest one is, you know, homicides, number of shootings, right? And if there's a high level of shootings, you know the community probably isn't the safest right now. Um, those are kind of the easier ones. One of the conversations that we were having years ago, and I think we're having it in Chicago, and then they're having it for a second here in, in LAPD was about relationship stat. So how do you measure the levels of relationships that you're building? And for us with, with LAPD, it was really um, working to change the incentives for policing, right? So if you get promoted, is it promoted because you arrested all these people and, and you have this track record, or is it how you treated people, right? So in order to transform some of the systems, and, and we're looking at transforming policing across the country, of course, right? That's a big question right now is the data, one, it's the data that you're collecting, but it's how you're also engaging communities and how you're investing in them, right? And I think that's what kind of shifts the paradigm. So how we utilize that data 
is going to be in order to help shape policy and help sh demonstrate that when you approach a community in a certain way with that, with that focus on customer service without criminalizing everybody, you're going to change the relationship. Now when we can measure that and demonstrate that it work, excuse me, that it works, we can start making steps towards kind of transforming how communities are engaged by law enforcement. But also from a violence reduction standpoint with peacemakers being out there engaging the most active individuals or the most, ones most prone, prone to crime is that because of the number of contacts per week that they're making with these individuals is violence going down, is the likelihood of retaliation dropping. Uh, that's harder to measure, but I think we need to be really creative in thinking how to, <coughs> how to do that systemically. And the grid's done it, and they've used um, more of a kind of predictive policing model, which you know, there's a little bit of controversy on, but yeah, it has shown, <laughs> it has shown, I mean, it has demonstrated that there are, there, what well, we know that there's a reduction in retaliations, but how do you prove it, right? And so I think the rigor of methodology with some stuff that is a little more esoteric, how do you, um, how do you compile it and then utilize that to demonstrate and help shape policy and change the way people think about investing in um, reducing crime and violence, increasing public safety by investing in community leadership in order to, to be those leaders. You know, go ahead. I, mean, I just had, you know, one of the other things, um, you know, I think it's important to note too is that, you know, for the longest time we've depended upon traditional frameworks really to help us understand that, again, the permutations of crime, and we've been doing that, as I mentioned earlier, for quite a number of years. <laughs> but just a you know, quick question uh, How many of you out there <clears throat> um, have a Twitter account, Instagram account? Raise your hand. Instagram, Facebook, right? right. Uh, thank you. And so some of you didn't raise your hands, and so you're officially classified as Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> is this being filmed? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, I guess the question is, you know, every single day when people see things in their communities, when they have community interactions, when they see um, a Tesla driving down the street and the, and the driver's asleep, right, and it's, you know, it's on autopilot, and so you know, we, we text, we tweet, we push information. Um, law enforcement, for a variety of reasons, doesn't track any of that information, right? But that notwithstanding are the types of things that really influence our perception, our perception of crime and whether or not we feel safe. Uh, to the question of whether or not we should reach out and try to calibrate in a very careful way ways to harvest that information to add to the body of knowledge and information that we use to change policy, um, build communities, influence communities in, in, in ways that are avant-garde. You know, that's yet another way to which we've not yet migrated I'm not sure there's a way to measure that. I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how we include that. Uh, but every single day, Dr. Southers, there, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that tweet, push, upload information, photographs, recordings. Um, and I'm just not so certain that we as a, a community really understand how to bring that information to bear in a responsible way um, so that it has an opportunity, so we have an opportunity to really look uh, in a very nuanced way at, at how to overcome some of the issues that, that really um, uh, challenge our communities. Well, you know, to your point and to Fernando's point about relationship data, and especially we're in an environment when we talk about public safety, we usually measure negatives, unfortunately. Um, we worked on a project, we've been in, in Minneapolis for five years working on some radicalization issues there, and what the community said is, why don't you stop measuring the number of young men that are going off to fight and start measuring how many people are graduating from high school? How many are going to college? Are more people getting jobs? Are they engaging in the electoral process and running for office? We'd like to see those numbers. But unfortunately, and, and, I've, and I've got some colleagues here from the media, those, that kind of information doesn't drive the news cycle. Um, what drives the news cycle are the number of guys going off to fight and the number of drive-by shootings. So I want to ask all of you as a last question, you know, what does a proactive set of data look like? And, I'm, and this is also the question I'm going to pitch to the tables when we open it up for 20 minutes. What does that look like? You know, I used to work gangs, and we got more money when there were more shootings. When gang violence went down, we had to go in front of city council and convince them we needed more money. I said, well, why would you need more money? Gang violence is going down. So, what does a proactive set of data look like? And can we, as Fernando suggested, can we talk about uh, a relationship stat, as, as particularly as it relates to 
law enforcement and policing and the community they serve? Um, well, first of all, you mentioned earlier, I think, I think it was you that mentioned earlier my, um, my, my affiliation with the, the LAPD program called the LAPD Cadet Leadership Program. Uh, we started that program in 2006 with um, about 450 youth, um, educational excellence, <coughs> um, leadership, life skills, decision making, financial literacy, just a you know, kind of a cornucopia of opportunities for young people in, in neighborhoods throughout the city of Los Angeles. Uh, when, I, and I, when I left on June 30th, um, 2016, after 17,562 days with the LAPD. But who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> with all my fingers and toes. Yeah. Um, we went from 450 youth to just this side of 9,000. Wow. Um, throughout the city of Los Angeles, uh, most of them were African American and Latino kids, whose families, by the way, didn't have a, a decent relationship with the LAPD, but yet they brought their kids. They didn't necessarily bring their kids to the LAPD to be LAPD officers, because that's not the, the, that wasn't the thing that we were emphasizing. We were emphasizing them succeeding in the real world, right? And, and we gave them a space, we gave them opportunity. With young people, you give them an opportunity, all you have to do is, is show them that bright light and, and move out of the way. Um, as an example of the, of the type of data that I believe that we should, should capture is what you mentioned earlier, that, um, that legion of young people who are desirous of succeeding. Uh, quick story, there's one young lady <clears throat> lived not too far from here. Uh, she tells a powerful story of who she should have been. She should have been a gang girl. She should have been on drugs. She should have been pregnant. She should have been in jail, right? But she found her way to this cadet leadership program. Uh, she ultimately kind of rose through the ranks and ended up being the chief cadet. She left, uh, went to college. Um, as a matter of fact, she graduated from Mount St. Mary's, went to law school at Southwestern School of Law. And today, that same young lady runs the USC Housing Law Clinic um, that we oversee here at USC. And then you wonder, and you ask yourself, you know, how did that happen? Those are the types of opportunities, to, to Dr. Souther's point, that there, I'm not sure that there's a tool, but it's something that we should, we should look at and find a way to create a framework so we can measure that information. Because the vast majority of those young people, he mentioned it earlier, of all the seniors that are involved in that program, nearly 100% of them graduate from high school. And we know, because the, <clears throat> the entry level GPA for the Cadet Leadership Program, at least it was at the time I was there, was 1.9%, because I knew, as probably you do as well, the body of cognitive literature suggests to us that if we marry underachievers with achievers, the entire bubble floats, right? And so that's not, that's not unknown to us. But putting a measurement tool to that, and then turning around and replicating it throughout our communities, um, I think the answer is right in front of us. The you know, question is, do we have the will? Do we have the will to want to do that? And, and by the way, it's to Fernando's point, a lot of this is not about policing. It has nothing to do with, with badges and guns, well, with respect to our colleagues. It has nothing to do with badges or guns or putting people in jail. It has everything to do with being responsible and understanding your, your, your position and your place in life and asking yourselves, for our children, do we want to see a better life for them? I think that's really the question. Fernando, Germana? So I'll just offer a couple of things and to, to build up on, on both, both of the ideas that you presented. I think the, the question around how we measure relationships is something we have struggled with for years, mm -hmm. particularly through my, my many years of work um, related to human relations and, and building positive intergroup relations, a lot of that is about relationships and how do you measure that? How do you measure the absence of something? And these are things that we've always struggled with. Um, a couple of things that perhaps I can offer in, in ways to kind of rethink about data and what we measure is kind of going back to this idea of risk factors and social protective factors. And some of the things, and, and again, I referenced the, the study by the CDC, but it's very much a lot of what we're really talking about here today. Um, can we measure communities' connectedness? Can we measure communities' ability to um, manage and access resources? Can we measure young people and individuals having personal connectedness to their families, to their neighborhoods? their ability to have the types of skills that will allow them to manage conflict, pro-social peers, how are they engaging with their peers. Um, these are individual 
um, indicators that we could certainly look at and measure, um, just as much as we can measure um, relationships. Um, we look at social cohesion and social inclusion. What does that look like in neighborhoods? Do individuals feel that they belong to their neighborhood and that they have the ability to prosper and to grow in those neighborhoods? I think these are all just some ideas around potential indicators that we could look at both at the relational level, at the community level, but also at the individual level. Um, and these are things we have not thought about in terms of once again, this idea of public safety. And so I think first and foremost, it's our ability to sort of break that cycle in our mindset in terms of public safety as solely being a law enforcement issue, which obviously it's much broader and much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a public health issue. I mean, public safety, violence is preventable and treatable. Um, and I think when we look at, as, as um, she was stating, is you know, looking at the individual level, cohesion, all of that, but also too, at the bureaucratic level, at the public sector level, is kind of coordination and continuum of care of services, right? Kind of alignment, right? Our services being coordinated, our agencies being held accountable for addressing the needs of this youth and this family. No. That's a huge piece, and that's maybe something that we should evaluate as well, right? How are systems being coordinated? Because the more coordination, the more, um, you know, the more kind of care and, and net that you'll have over the community. Violence in community is perpetuated by individuals, but it's also, too, they're all connected to families. And communities are just really networks of families. So if you can start working with those networks of families and individuals, you're going to start to see violence go down. But then also you have to invest and build capacity to have their voices raised to say, okay, well, this is what community safety is now. Violence has gone down. And I keep telling people that, you know, I'm tired of saying in L.A. that, you know, we've been below 300 homicides for, over, for 10 years, you know. <laughs> Three, that's 300 too many. Mm -hmm. We have a vision zero for pedestrian safety. We don't, we don't want people getting hit by cars, cars, but we need a vision zero for violence, for gang-related violence, right. right? And that goes back to what uh, Chief Pacinger said, is that there has to be that political will to do it. We need a vision zero. And actually, um, Chief Beck, one of his last speeches before he, he left, before he retired, was at the gang conference, and he said, I could see zero. And that's a whole different, that's a whole different, that's a paradigm shift. Can we get to zero gang-related homicides? In, in Chicago, they're saying they have a 399 movement. They want to get down to 399. That's their goal. Ours, we've been below 300. Let's get to zero, right? And so when we talk about utilizing data and saying, look, this is what's worked. We've been below 300. How do we get to, how do we get to zero? That's going to take another level of investment, but we're going to have to get more creative. What got us here is not going to get us there. And where there is, is that zero. How do we get there? I think that's where we have to be creative. That's where we have to hold people accountable. We have to coordinate systems. We have to increase investments. We have to continue to invest in communities so that communities can actually be in the driver's seat of it. They're not going to run the whole thing, but they're going to be in the driver's seat. They're going to say, this is what's going to work, and this is what we need in our communities. These are the gaps. Because as we're closing the community to prison pipeline, and as people are coming out of the criminal justice system, as we're working to reform it, they're coming back to these communities. And if there is no longer term investment, it's not just, just intervention and prevention all day. Now we're going to start to need economic investment. We're going to have to start improving education and access to education. We're going to have to start transforming it at the community level. As we are changing the economic system from the mass incarceration economic system, there has to be an economic system that allows our communities to thrive. Excellent. So first of all, I'd like a round of applause for our panel. But I, and I don't want to take away from the table talk, but I'd be remiss if I couldn't at least entertain at least one question from the floor or, or two from the panel. So Peter has the mic, and we'll start over there. Hi, thank you for uh, just for, for sharing. I guess my question is in, in the topic of public safety. Um, uh, you know, I'm from Santa Monica, and, and the community's changed so much. Folks really. For me, what I struggle with is the gentrification and, and kind of how that, you know, by the business community, pro-development, they kind of frame that as um, part of the reason the data changed and public safety isn't what it was in terms of crime, violence, et cetera, um, when what's not being seen is, I think, Fernando, to your point, is like the investment in community agency, uh, the partnerships, the, the advocacy, the work happening. So I guess my question is like how how do you respond to that narrative when folks are 
they look at gentrification as a positive and, and partly responsible to the numbers changing when we know that it's much more nuanced and sort of it's deeper than that. Yeah, so gentrification for sure. I mean, across the country, you go to Oakland, um, Chicago, same conversations. LA, we're having that conversation all the time. I mean, California will probably be gentrified out of violence soon. I mean, it's getting so expensive to live here, right? So that's why affordable housing and you know economic development is needed. We need to keep people here. Um, in LA, there has been a lot of people that have left, moved to Antelope Valley in the 90s. It was the Inland Empire, um, and there, you know, there's issues out there. So violence, you know, can spread, and there's. I, my, my indicator is the Dodger games. When I watch the Dodger games, I watch them play in Arizona or Colorado, and I see a bunch of Dodger fans in there. I say, those are economic refugees from L.A., right? <laughs> People that have left, all right? So that's, that's my indicator. That's my measurement. But um, I mean, gentrification does play a role. Um, I, I don't think we, we can negate that because part of what we have to ask ourselves is that as we work to make communities safer and the violence goes down in these areas that have historic high levels of violence, a lot of memories, a lot of history in those communities, is that all for what? Because then is it just going to be taken over and those people aren't going to be able to live there anymore? And so that, I mean, I think you raise a very important conversation that does have, uh, that plays a role in it. But I think that the, the level of investment in communities consistently, I think for the last 10 years under Speaking LA, we've seen really a level of empowerment and people that are really taking uh, leadership and creating communities for safety. And it's about changing that culture of violence in their communities as well. And so. Investment goes a long way, and it should be a lot more, right? 32,000 sounds like a lot, and people across the country are like, wow, that's, man, that's awesome. You need to multiply that probably times 10. Well, I won't get into what you spend to, for probation youth, but if you invest that in each, it's $233,000 in each individual per year, you can change their lives. You can send them to college and grad school, right? So that's a very important point. Thank you. You know, it's, inter it's interesting, too, that um, some of you have heard, many of you have heard, you know, about the caustic environment at the DMV, right? The, you know, I was in line um, a couple of weeks or so ago. You know, after things had gotten better, I was in line for two hours. And, and by the way, there's no, no offense to anybody who works at DMV. In the, in the, um, but the reason that there has been so, so much monumental change at the DMV, or there's been discussion about the DMV, is that so many people are impacted, right? And until we all get angry, about some of these social uh, challenges, again, not law enforcement, but the social challenges, until we say we've had enough and we're just not going to deal with it anymore, um, that's one thing will change. Uh, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is a $17 billion a year corporate enterprise, right? Can you imagine if we flip the script and take that $17 billion and invest it in our communities? I think we'll see a change. Um, provide that, provide those dollars, those resources, the economic development, the jobs, the health care, um, investment in our youth, and we give that money to each individual community and hold them accountable um, for making sure that those, those dollars are spent in a, in a rational, fair, and an authentic way. That's when we'll see a change in our communities, I think. I think I, we have time for one more. Okay. Yes, I, um, I really appreciated uh, all the information and uh, the nuances and the, um, the interchange. Um, a, a question that I had um, for Giovanna was uh, you talked about the um, CDE uh, risk factors for violence and violence prevention, and then you talked about the, uh, the, you know, the level of, of data that you're using in your department and you know, the kinds of analyses that you're doing. And my question is whether currently or in the future, uh, you could use that data to engage the community in the kinds of dialogues that we're talking about and perhaps you know, look to um, um, produce those kinds of indicators that you were uh, describing that would show what you called the, um, uh, the, oh sorry, the, uh, the system allows the community to thrive and um, measuring the absence of something. Um, that's my Thank question. You. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I think my immediate answer would be absolutely. I think the, the whole uh, premise of everything that we do is how we engage communities. We already look at some of those indicators in our work. For instance, we already measure how well our services and our programs are uh, providing access to education, increasing academic achievements. These are um, 
indicators and measures that we're already collecting. Um, I think there is a lot more to be done in this arena. And I think if we start to then look at um, this idea of, of connectedness and cohesion, whether we're talking about connectedness within a family or within a neighborhood or within a community, uh, but these are things that we could do more work around how we measure. So some of those indicators we're already measuring, but not, not all of it. And, and it's only happening in terms of the services that in this particular section of our department is being provided. But are we doing that on a citywide basis, for example, in various elements? I mean, there are a number of nonprofit organizations who do tremendous amount of work in that space. Um, and when we start to think about measuring the data and indicators, is there a place where we can aggregate those measures so that we have a much sort of broader, bigger picture of what that looks like? But at the heart of it really is community engagement because we very much look to the community and the neighborhoods we work with to identify where needs, gaps, um, how we can lift uh, people out of poverty. And, and certainly we just talked a little bit about this um, element around gentrification. Um, and how in, an, in a city where we're striving economically, how do we lift everybody up so that everyone has the same opportunity and upward mobility? So thank here's you. what we're going to do. I've got a, first again, I want to thank the panel. It's just a, it's a conversation certainly we could have for a much longer period of time. But we, everyone has come here this morning. We don't want to talk at you. We do want you to be able to talk to each other. So we have a facilitator at each table. We're going to open up for table talks. You can talk about any aspect of this that we've discussed this morning, and then we'll we'll just wrap it up. Okay, we'll, we'll just close after that. So um, if the facilitators will take over, um, and, and we'll give you about 10, 10 minutes uh, to discuss, and then we'll close after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate, again, Microsoft for seating providing some seed resources to begin this journey. Um, I also wanted just to recognize two people that have been central to the actual nuts and bolts work. Uh, Peter Griffin, who's been with us, he's a master's candidate in the Price School. And Ellie Shane, who may have already left. Oh, there's Ellie. So Ellie, can you uh, wave? She doesn't even hear me right now. She's taking notes. Wave, wave. You don't want to wave? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Ellie Shane is our amazing data and program manager for NDSC. They've been working very hard to help coordinate the work here. Again, we invite your continued participation. You know, you can do it through social media, you can do it through official convenings like this, but it's through understanding how you work in your community. I think we're going to get better sense of how we can both measure and track uh, the changes in public safety in our community. So thanks once again for everyone being here today.